Welcome to FACT's webinar called A Deeper Dive into Livestock Guardian Dogs. Our presenter is Jan Donor. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the webinar this evening. Thank you all so much for joining us today. So to begin with just a few quick introductions, FACT is a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois. We promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. Please visit our website to learn more about all of our farmer services, including more upcoming webinars and our Fund to Farmer grants. In case you haven't heard, we are currently accepting grant applications. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce our esteemed and acclaimed presenter, Jan Donor. Jan is an author, educator, and researcher who lives on her small family farm in Michigan. Jan has over 40 years of hands-on experience using livestock Guardian Animals for Predator Control. She's also the author of Livestock Guardians Using Dogs, Donkeys, and Llamas to Protect Your Herd and the Encyclopedia of Animal Predators. We're incredibly lucky to have Jan with us tonight to share her experience and her expertise, and she will be available to answer your questions later on in the webinar. So with that, I am going to pass the mic over to Jan so she may start her presentation. Take it away, Jan. Thank you, Larissa. Um, and I want to welcome everybody who's here tonight. And it was interesting to take a look at the polls and we'll sort of keep that in mind. Um, I'm really pleased that FACT has been sponsoring these webinars and that they're willing to let us go into more depth because th this is a topic that we all keep learning. We keep learning more and more things and um, there's just so much to know and to keep adapting to situations and things that I'm just really thrilled we're getting into this more. So livestock guardian dogs are the most widely used livestock guardian. We did talk about llamas and donkeys a little bit in our last webinar, but the dogs are by far used the most and they are the most successful because they work against all predators and they're very flexible with different types of stock and poultry, but they do require more knowledge um, to implement them and to utilize them well. So tonight we are going to um, begin with a really brief look at how the breeds developed. And that's important because it informs their correct temperament and their behaviors, which are inherited and they need to be selected for by people breeding these dogs. Because most people are not very familiar with the breeds, we're gonna take a really whirlwind tour to show you the breeds that you're likely to find here in North America, both to help you identify them and to just you know, sort of highlight their differences a little bit. If you're interested in learning more about the breeds and you want much more detailed information, um, I'm gonna send you to my book, Farm Dogs, um, which has in-depth profiles of all the livestock guardian dog breeds and talks about their working traits. Um, other good places to learn more are breed associations, if they have them. Not all livestock guardian dogs have breed associations and also like knowledgeable and experienced breeders. We're going to talk about crossbred livestock guard dogs. They are very common and what to look for and what to avoid. We're going to address the persistent misconceptions and misunderstandings out there. They are mostly about training and handling livestock guard dogs. And we're going to look at the specifics of finding and selecting puppies, adults, and rescue dogs. Then we're going to talk about what to do the first few days and the varying ways you can raise a working LGD to suit your own situation. As always, these recommendations are to give the most people the best chance of success. There are always exceptions. Every situation, owner and dog is unique. And I'm also primarily talking about livestock guard dogs on typical farm or ranch scenarios, people who are truly grazing on open range out west, um, have a, a different set of, of problems and issues and things that they're dealing with. Some of the things are in, they have in common. So we're going to pause for a very, very small history lesson to help explain how we arrived here. This is a very old illustration of LGDs um, depicting the Italian Marema. And ancient Roman writers were clear about the purpose and the behavior and the best breeders and even the color of livestock guard dogs. They recommended white so the dogs would blend in with the sheep and surprise the wolf. Ancient Romans would still recognize the Italian Marema. 
it's still very much as it existed 2,000 years ago. So as soon as humans domesticated other animals, they started needing dogs to help guard them. The types that we call livestock guard dogs were developed where stock was taken out to graze away from home, usually up in the mountains in summer, or where migratory people move constantly in search of pasture. These dogs were originally called sheep dogs or shepherds. Modern sheep dogs, shepherds, and herding dogs are something else entirely, and they were developed much later. Livestock guard dogs are not true mastiffs either, although sometimes that name is also used for them. So it's all a bit confusing. Livestock guard dogs were not part of our farming or stock traditions here in North America. We did not use them before the 1970s and 80s, and this is all new to us. So that's one reason we're all still learning. So livestock guardian dogs have several common traits, and they can be problems for you if you're not prepared for them. Don't think that you can train or socialize these traits out of these dogs. They inherit these traits. So livestock guard dogs are protective of territory, people, stock. They're naturally aggressive to predators. They need no aggression training, only socialization and supervision and correction of incorrect behavior or rough play. And that was traditionally done by shepherds or maybe older dogs. They all display reactive or defensive aggression. It's appropriate for them. Don't expect to train it away. Good socialization and handling will help them develop discretion and good judgment in their defense. They're all independent thinkers. They can be affectionate, but also they can be aloof. Don't expect obedience at all times. They're not inclined to obey your commands if they perceive a threat. Some breeds are also used as home, estate, or caravan guardians, and they can be somewhat more people-oriented, but they're still not going to be a biddable breed like a herding dog or a hunting dog. They're dominant and assertive and strong-willed, and they require experienced, skilled, or confident handlers. They're slow to mature. Although they look big, they're not fully mature till two, two and a half when they often take a sudden turn towards seriousness. They are likely to roam or patrol beyond their, your property if they're not contained. They were all developed on open grazing by full-time shepherds. So this urge to patrol is real. Although some dogs will stick tighter to their stock, this is part of who they are. Barking is also part of who they are. It's how they work. Speaking dog language with other wild canines or predators, which usually lessens with maturity and confidence in your input. They are similar in appearance. They're all very large. They have drop ears. They never have erect ears. They usually have curling tails, although some can be bobbed. They have warm double coats that shed water and dried mud, and they can range from short to long. They are usually 80 to 140 pounds or so, depending on breed and individuals. And really overly large dogs can't work as well or as long, and they aren't used by shepherds in their homelands. Some of the really, truly oversized dogs that you see are a result of show breeding. So I'm going to take a quick look with these maps, um, where they came from. As I mentioned earlier, they were developed and used in a sweep of countries with flocks that moved in summer, often higher in mountains or plateaus, and then back to winter grazing or to villages. So it's from the Pyrenees and other areas in Spain and Portugal to France, the Alps and the Alpines in Italy and the Balkans, across to the Carpathians, the Eastern European Plains, and into Turkey. Now, look that LGDs were not used in Britain and Ireland or Northern Europe or Germany or the Nordic countries. No LGD breeds come from those countries. And um, if that's a good way to help you distinguish these breeds from maybe dogs that we're a lot more familiar with. With the return of large predators in Europe, something that's interesting is that these breeds are being introduced into new areas in Europe as well. And then their homelands continue here into Armenia and Georgia and Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and the other sort of we call stand countries, and then into the Himalayas. Quite often, the dogs in some of these areas were traveling with nomadic tribes in their stock. So this sweep of countries in this map, these two maps that I showed you, are useful in describing the reactive or defensive aggression 
of livestock guard dogs, with some breed exceptions, of course. Generally, the breeds from Western Europe are slightly less reactive, which means they have a slower fuse. They're more forgiving. They're more user-friendly for beginners. As you move to the east, those dogs can be more reactive. They have a quicker fuse. They're more dominant and maybe are better suited to experienced owners in appropriate situations. So now we're going to take a really quick tour of the livestock guard dogs found in North America, partially to illustrate that they're not all alike, but also to let you know what you're going to find when you go out there. And all the photos are, are just beautiful, and they're from my book, Farm Dogs. And I'm going to give you one little caveat. It's very true that everyone thinks their breed is the absolute best, me included. So you have to take all glowing descriptions that come from owners of the grain of salt. Many people have only owned one breed and they may not have the experience to compare them to other breed. Or just because that breed is perfect for one person doesn't mean it's best for you. And of course, individual dogs can vary from their, the norm of their breed. So this is the Great Pyrenees, and it's probably what most people think of livestock guard dogs worldwide. Um, LGD folks often shorten it to GP or PEER. And when we first needed livestock guard dogs here in North America, this was the most numerous breed here, and it formed the basis of our working dogs. They're readily available, sometimes crossbred, frankly, backyard bred sometimes. Um, I've received several questions before our webinar started asking me whether or not there are still good working Pyrenees out there. And my answer is absolutely yes. Of course, like in any dog breed, if you don't select for working temperament and behavior, you can change a breed. And frankly, some people want a big white fluffy dog as a pet, and some breeders may choose for that temperament. But there are good working peers out there, but you have to look for the breeders of working dogs. And I have found that at the GP Club of America, there is a specific contact person now in charge of working dogs, and there is a separate list of working dog breeders, and I've put it on my website to sort of help. I think Great Pyrenees also have a reputation for wandering, and I really think that poor fencing or training is often to blame, and because peers are just so numerous, everybody hears this. A peer is still the excellent choice for the first livestock guard dog or in a situation where you need a more measured reaction. 40 years ago, my very first livestock guardian dog was a peer, and I learned a lot from that dog. These breeds are also from the area of Spain and Portugal, and they're more rare here. They're less reactive like the peer. They worked closely with shepherds and they lived with people as their companions as well. The Spanish Mastiff can be quite large and heavy, has a big heavy double dewlap. It comes in a variety of colors. The Pyrenean Mountain Dog is sort of reveals his heritage between the Spanish Mastiff and the Great Pyrenees. And the Estrella Mountain Dog has a completely different appearance. He can be fawn, yellow, wolf gray, shaded. Um, and they're good family dogs that also enjoy companionship. So sometimes they're a good choice for sort of a farm dog for your family. Here's the Marema, the ancient dog the Romans would recognize. Um, they're also low reactive sort of dogs. They're affectionate and loyal to their owners and they have a reputation for bonding closely to stock. They are also a bit of a smaller size 70 to 100 pounds, although in Italy there can be, um, there's also a larger variety. We just don't usually see that here. The Kuvas and the Commodore are both from Hungary, but they were developed and used by different ethnic groups. They're more rare and they're mostly companions, although some people definitely still use them as LGDs. The Kuvas um, was also an estate guardian. He was occasionally a hunting or military dog, so he seems to have higher energy than most other LGDs. Um, they enjoy a strong human bond, although they're suspicious of strangers, and they might not be as happy in a situation where they don't have contact with their family. They can also be a little smaller in that sort of 70 to 115 pound size range. The Commodore looks comic, but he's actually a very serious dog, very protective. He needs regular owner attention. He's more highly reactive. In my personal opinion, he's not a beginner dog. Um, the coat can be a problem in wet, damp climates, so working dogs are often clip shorter, not shaved, but just clipped to keep those, the hair or the dreadlocks shorter. These three breeds are all very rare here. They're all a similar size, sort of 70 to 110 pounds. They tend to be more energetic than some of the other livestock guardian dog breeds, but they're still low reactive sort of dogs. The Torniak is from 
Croatia and Bosnia Herzegovina. And the other two white breeds are the Slovensky Chuvac, where it's it, in its homeland, it's primarily bred as a companion dog. And then there's the Polish Tatra. And sometimes some people are describing this breed as a herder as well as an LGD. And frankly, these two things are incompatible in a full-time working dog. So I'm advising people not to choose puppies from people um, who are breeding for this herding aspect because you're likely to run into higher energy or prey drive. And that's not a good thing in a working livestock guard dog. These two breeds are, are were rare, but they're really growing in popularity here. The Karakachan is from Bulgaria. Um, many folks might know Dr. Phil Sponenberg from the Livestock Conservancy, and he was instrumental in bringing them here to North America. He liked how they were a smaller size, uh, less aggressive to humans, less likely to roam, he believed. And their breed association looks for authentic working dogs, not the city dogs that are known as Bulgarian Shepherds. It's a very diverse breed. They can come in all different colors and coats. They can even have naturally bobbed tails or short tails. Um, the Shar Planinac, or more commonly called the Shar, is from Macedonia and the former Yugoslavia. And this is a courageous, tough dog, and it's finding great success, especially on the western ranches in North America against large predators. It has a very long and dense coat and comes in, it, that comes in various colors, often this wolf gray sort of look. The Anatolian Shepherd is the second most popular working livestock guard dog in North America. He's sometimes called the ASD. Um, he's also often seen in crosses, often with the Pyrenees, because these are the two most numerous breeds here. Um, the Anatolian is based on a broad range of dogs brought from Turkey in the 1980s, and they, it's proven very successful and popular here, and they have developed into their own breed. There is a range in appearance and behaviors because they in include various land race breeds in their background. Um, so they can be a little variable in their reactivity and their appearance. They come in all different colors and coats. They're... These are the two, uh, two of the parent breeds of the Anatolian, and they are both popular here now. The Akbash dog is especially successful in North America on the range. It's, it tends to be a slightly more aloof dog, I think, and independent-minded, and it will do well in a range sort of situation. Um, and it has some diversity in appearance. They can be more elegant, long-legged, or heavier boned, and the coats can be very short, like this one here, or they can be long and thick in, in a white coat that you might be more comfortable, more familiar with. The Kongal dog is the national dog of Turkey and it's moderately reactive. It's slightly more people oriented because it also worked as a you know, guardian in the homes of rich folks. It's about 90 to 145 pounds, but it shouldn't be huge over that size. It always has a short coat and it's always fawn with a black mask, muzzle and ears. The Central Asian Shepherd and the Caucasian of Charka in my opinion, are two breeds that are not especially recommended for newbies. Both were taken into Russia from their homelands. They were bred by the Soviet Red Army as guard and patrol dogs, and you want to avoid those dogs that might come from those lines that were bred for military or show. So you need to look for the authentic working dogs. They Both breeds can be short to long-haired, and they come in several colors and patterns. They are moderate in energy, and they're highly reactive. The first breed is the Central Asian Shepherd. Um, so it's sometimes called Cass or CAO for Central Asian of Charka. Of Charka just means shepherd. Uh, it was often known by nomadic people in those stand countries that we talked about. And the Aboriginal dogs that are still out there with the shepherds are the ones that are best suited to work as livestock guard dogs. And they usually have cropped ears and tails, which makes them a little distinctive. The Caucasian of Charka is from the Caucasus Mountains, and they mostly worked as... Um, they were livestock and property gardens, but they aren't being bred here for that purpose at all. And very few of them would be suitable. And you would really have to find somebody that had a working line that they were working on. Um, I'm going to finish this little tour with the Tibetan Mastiff. Um, it's from the Himalayas, as you probably know. And um, it lived closely with people in villages and with nomads. And it, it it's still the best home for a Tibetan Mastiff is it, having 
contact with humans. Um, they are low energy. They can be variable reactivity. They have that serious appearance. They have long hair in various colors. You have to not confuse it with those really oversized Tibetan mastiffs that Chinese breeders have recently been breeding and selling for huge amounts of money. They're hugely overweight dogs with grossly ex exaggerated features. They sell for thousands of dollars. That's not the traditional working dog. There are a few other very rare um, livestock guard dog breeds here, and um, but you're not as likely to see them. So this this is we're going to sort of finish our tour looking at these photographs because I love them. It's also valuable for us to remember that in their homelands, livestock guard dogs worked in close partnership with their shepherds and with other livestock guard dogs of various ages. Shepherds traveled with their dogs to summer pastures. They were often accompanied by whole families who lived in summer shelters, making cheese from sheep or goat milk. Other livestock guard dogs traveled with migratory people year round. They went out or some went out with their shepherd during the day to graze and then back to a village. Dogs may have been left with stock for short periods of time or overnight, but the shepherds are always nearby. A puppy was never left completely alone with stock without supervision for long periods of time. Puppies were raised in the company of older dogs and under the watchful eyes of shepherds. So beside, despite that widespread and mistaken advice, hands-off raising and placing a completely unsupervised pup directly with the flock are not advisable. Your relationship with your dog helps foster his ability to discern friend from foe and to accept people and animals that you accept. And it's really critically important. And it's important to keep this knowledge in mind as sometimes today we are asking our dogs to do something much harder than what they did originally. So a brief mention of um, working crosses because they're very common. There are a lot of them and they can be a fine, effective working dog, but it's really important to stay within the livestock guard dog breed group, these breeds that we've been talking about, if you want the dog to be able to perform a job. The dog in this picture is a cross between an Anatolian Shepherd and a Great Pyrenees, and that's this is typically how they look. They, they are long-haired, but they can have different color than appear. We are now seeing more crosses between two breeds, three breeds, four breeds, and I just want people to remember that this is not like mixing paint, like a friend of mine says. All pups are individuals as much as you and your siblings are individuals. You can look like one parent, act like the other parent, and this is especially true in mixing of three or four breeds, which we are seeing more of. So it's kind of meaningless to make a generalization about how the pup will behave once you get down to three or four breeds being involved in its crossbreeding. So if you're looking for a crossbreed pup or you're buying one, it is useful to research the parent breeds because the pup may look like one or the other. Um, you can't always predict this if the parents are you know, widely different and stuff, but it it, it is a way for you to figure out what might be in there a little bit. Other important considerations. They need to be the right size. It, a eight week old livestock guard dog pup should weigh about 20 pounds. If you see one that's eight pounds or 12 pounds, there's something else in there. That's not how much they weigh. By four months, they should weigh about 40 pounds. Um, you can always consult an experienced person to take a look at a picture of a crossbred dog you are thinking of because they can often spot wrong color or coat or erect or odd ears or head shape or tail shape, even if you are not familiar with all those things yet. Um, and some crosses have bad coats, um, to be upfront about it, because they're, you're mixing two different types of coats and you might lose the good working coat. So here's the f famous misconceptions that we've been talking about. Um, we know more now about how these dogs work. I think people saw dogs out with the, with the sheep or the goats and they assumed that they were raised out there with them. It's also a misunderstanding of the essential bonding period and the importance of being with sheep and other stock when it's still a puppy. That never meant that we left them alone and raised them hands off and resulting in feral dogs. In their homelands, they worked with shepherds. Poultry was never a traditional stock for these dogs, sheep, goats, sometimes cattle. Poultry is actually the hardest thing we ask them to do because they do not form bonds with poultry like they do with other animals. In reality, lots of livestock guard dogs have killed a bird or two, often as a result of rough play or being licked to death, and they are not ruined. It's, it's just going to be a matter of your training and their maturity. 
it's true that some tightly bonded dogs will stay with their stock, but they will also roam out of their fences to stay with them because that's what they did in the open ranges of their homeland. It's not about bound, boundary, boundary chaining. They're not a bad dog if they roam. These, this is part of their nature and we have to figure out how to work with it. Dogs also roam because they're looking for breeding, they're out patrolling, sometimes they're bored in a really small space or they only have a few animals to guard. Keeping them home in our culture is really important because of the liability, the danger to the dog, and because you need them at home with your stock. That's why you need a good fence. So while the livestock guard dog breeds do have strong similarities, I think we've sort of seen that there are definite differences between them. And probably one of the most important things is that reactivity we were talking about, that fuse and how short or long it is. And then finally, crossbred with another livestock guard dog is not a good idea. It might be fine for a pet or for a companion. But I want you to just think about a 130-pound, protective, dominant, independent-thinking livestock guard dog crossed with a herding or hunting dog that has high energy and high prey drive. And this is the most common cross we see on a farm, often by accident. Um, crosses with other breeds can also water down or eliminate the defensive aggression that a livestock guard dog needs, or the nurturing nature, or produce dogs with coats that are unsuitable for living outdoors year round and other issues. So that's where we, we advise you to stay within the breed group. How to find one after all this. So I'm frequently asked where um, I can find a reliable trained adult. And just right up front, a good trained adult dog is extremely valuable to his owner and he's not likely for sale. People just don't raise dogs for two years and sell them as a business. You might be extremely fortunate to find one. You might find an adult that needs rehoming for various reasons or a rescue, but it often tends to be more common that people raise a pup. A good breeder chooses parent dogs because they are sound and mature and they have good health and they have excellent working behaviors and instincts, not just because they happen to own a male and a female. You need to ask a lot of questions. You need to demand proof of parents registrations if they're purebred dogs, ask to see them, ask to see the pedigrees, ask to see hip scores, don't take their word for it. Even if you're looking at a dog that doesn't have some of these things, these are good things for breeders to understand um, are important things they should be doing too. Ask for references, contact them, ask the people if you can visit them, even if you can't, because the answer might tell you a lot about the person and whether or not they have something to maybe hide. Be prepared for a lot of questions from the breeder. There might be a waiting list. There's going to be a cost. But the, 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 the worthwhile thing about searching out a good breeder is they can be a lifelong mentor to you as well. So where do you look? Breed clubs are one thing. Many livestock guard dog breed clubs are very independent. They're not show oriented. They have breeders with working dogs or breeders who regularly place working pups. You should also ask people that have good full-time working livestock guard dogs over the age of two, not just a puppy, because all puppies are wonderful, but you want to know how the dog matured. Look on Facebook, there are groups about available dogs. The livestock and agriculture groups are an excellent place, especially those in your state or your area or with the livestock that you raise. And then there is rescue, and we're gonna talk in a little bit more about that in a minute. So red flags when you're out looking for a dog. First of all, reputable breeders don't advertise on Craigslist or similar places, they just don't do it. Overly cheap dogs. If you think about what you would pay for any other dog you would buy, no offense to cockapoos or doodles or whatever, they cost a lot of money and you are looking for a dog that's going to protect your valuable stock. It's worth as much. Um, and another fact is a breeder can't buy good dogs and provide good care for them and their pups and still sell the pups for a small amount of money. It's very likely a good purebred pup is going to cost you up to $1,200 or $2,000. Good crossbred dogs up to $750 dog, dollars, depending on availability and area. You need to ask about um, health screening. Another thing that I, I think is important is if the person doesn't seem to have any knowledge about the breed. They can't spell the breed name. They make false claims about the breed. That's a red flag in my mind that they are not informed about what they're doing. 
So harden your heart. You're buying a working dog to protect your farm. If you find parents at the farm that you show up at looking for puppies and the parents are feral and the puppies look sick or lame or lethargic or tiny, these people will just breed more dogs if you buy the puppies from them. You're not rescuing them. You're looking for a working partner on your farm. And finally, be um, cautious about internet seduction. I, I'm, I don't want to overstate this, but a flashy website doesn't make a person an expert. Um, you need to confirm all the claims about a dog or a breed, especially if you're dealing with somebody at a distance. You need to Google the people and ask for references. And it's also very hard to import a dog where you're not seeing what you're buying. We are seeing more sort of bait and switch deceptions overseas, like send the money first and they don't send a dog or they send a different dog or there's fake pedigrees. Uh, there's just a, it's just not, um, a really easy thing to do. So how to select a puppy. So a good breeder has been observing their pups for several weeks and th that observation over weeks tells them a great deal about the puppy's temperament and behaviors. And if you're buying a puppy from a breeder who's a distance from you, you're really going to be relying on this. But sometimes you're left with the choice. So give yourself some time to observe and I'm going to, in the next slide, give you some things that you can look at. Don't choose a sick or a lame or an unusually lethargic puppy. Pink pigment on the lips, nose, or eyelids can be a problem if a dog's going to live outside and be exposed to sun all the time. Um, unusually large dogs can have orthopedic problems, and unusually small dogs, there can easily be something wrong with as well, or they're crossbred with something else. Either a male or a female is fine. Research has proven that they both sexes guard equally well. If you're adding a second dog, it's best to avoid two females. A male and a female or two neutered males are more likely to have to get along. Finally, we recommend that pups stay with their mother and their siblings to their at least eight to 10 weeks of age and preferably 12 weeks because this extended time lets pups learn to play and interact and develop good bite inhibition. And if your pup is, is receiving really good livestock experience and you're a first time owner, you might even consider extending this period a little bit. Um, but if the dog, the puppy is not with stock, you need to bring him home and you need to begin that bonding and socialization process. So if you are left with the choice of selecting a puppy from a litter, there are some things that you can look for. It's not as good as observations over time, um, but it's very helpful. And remember that you are not looking for the best pet or companion dog. You are looking for a working dog. So sometimes these things are a little bit at odds with what we might look for if we were choosing a dog to be our family companion. Dogs with lower activity levels are usually more suited and easier to train as livestock guard dogs than highly active dogs. Live livestock guard dogs are supposed to have low or moderate energy levels. Some pups will already exhibit very low chase or prey drives, and you can test this by throwing a small object past them. Dogs with low prey drive will often just watch the thrown object go by or maybe investigate it once, but not again. And I personally would avoid puppies that chase and fight over a thrown toy or the pup that continually chases it. Uh, look for a pup that's interested in you, but not overly aggressive or fearful or shy. The pup that runs up to you first or in, then and then insists on being in your face all the time may not be a good choice for a working dog. Full-time guardians should be more independent-minded problem solvers that are not highly dependent on human companionship. So a pup that walks away after meeting you or maybe goes and lays down and sleeps away from the pack or or buy stock or something is a really good choice. You wanna look for a calm and thoughtful pup, um, avoid pups that growl or bite or struggle when you handle them. And especially pay attention to this sort of a puppy that might have um, too low of a sensitivity to pain. Working dogs are going to be poked and prodded by livestock. So you have to avoid dogs that are overreact to pain like that. Um, most livestock guard dogs are extremely stoic, actually. And you can test this with a little gentle pinch between the toes or something and see what kind of reaction that you get. And if you're able to watch them with stock, obviously that is really good good thing. Look for a pup that's curious. Look for a pup that maybe avoids eye contact. Avoid pups that um, are 
that bark or jump or bite stock. An older pup should definitely be starting to act submissive and calm around stock and look for those good behaviors as walking up, at, like walking up to stock rather than running or moving away from the stock or dropping to the ground or rolling over or lowering the head and tail, licking at the mouths of stock, choosing next to, to sleep next to stock, even through a fence. Those are all really good signs. So you often, um, he, you know, hear about this. You could hear advice from people that say you should buy two puppies at once because they'll play with each other and provide companionship. And you need two livestock guard dogs anyway, people will say. And you might. <laughs> and of course, you will hear from people where these things have worked out wonderfully. But I, I do want to warn you that when things go bad, they can go really, really bad when you, you get two puppies at once. First of all, not all farms need two livestock guard dogs. One dog can be sufficient for a small hobby farm that only has a handful of animals and very low predator pressure. If you have high predator pressure, you probably have the need for multiple livestock guardians. And you probably are looking for some adult dogs right away. And then you can add young dogs to the mix. Raising your first livestock guard dog pup is always the most challenging. Two is frankly double the work and trouble. So they need a lot of separate attention and handling. They're more likely to egg each other on into trouble. And they need to be separated from each other enough that they don't become inseparable and completely focused on each other rather than you or your stock. Another thing to consider if you get two pups at the same time is you're going to end up with two old livestock guard dogs at the same time. And then there's this issue of sibling aggression that can arise as they become real. I'm just going to tell you to Google litter mate syndrome to read lots of information by dog behaviorists and trainers. And it's not just litter mates, two pups of the same age. Um, and it's real. It does happen. If you need two livestock guard dogs, my recommended method, it's either to raise one pup to ad adulthood and then raise the second <clears throat> or locate a reliable adult and then also raise a pup. Staggering the ages by four or five years is also a really good method. By the time the older one is slowing down, the younger dog will be an adult. Now, the big exception here is if you have a big operation and you have stock in separate fields where the pups can be separated, or if you're placing them with different adult mentors or something, that's a different situation. And handling a couple pups there is a lot easier. Rehomed or rescue dogs are really common. And frankly, most livestock guard dogs make a good transition to a new home, but you need to know why the dog is being rehomed or, or, and you need to evaluate why. Sometimes it's a farmer disbanding his flock or leaving the farm. There could be dog conflicts on the farm that aren't the individual dog's problem. They can be an official re rescue dog. They can be a pet. If it's a pet, <clears throat> you need to evaluate whether these were pet problems or serious problems that the dog had. Frequently, it's a mismatch between true working traits and a family, you know, suburban backyards and livestock guard dogs don't always mix well. Barking and boredom and being protective are things that don't fit in there, but can be transitioned, you know, to their new home on a farm. Ask about behavior towards other animals, such as pets, and whether they're already roaming, or there's some food aggression, escaping fences. Look for some of those same qualities we discussed in a pop, things like prey drive and energy level and temperament. Always make sure you can handle any rescue or rehome dog and that you feel safe around it in your family. Be cautious for several weeks because the bad behavior often emerges after a few weeks and the, the dog is settling down and starts to think of your home as their territory and they may get a little more pushy or dominant. Best place is to find a reliable adult. Um, there are LGD locator or finder groups on Facebook where people are trying to rehome dogs or find them. Livestock groups on Facebook also frequently people are talk about available dogs or not. State ag groups, um, the LGD bre breed clubs frequently have rescue dogs and there are even some people who are sort of experienced at this rehabbing and they look for good prospects and work with them for a little bit. I will caution you that those general or multi-breed rescue groups don't know very much about livestock guard dogs and don't can't evaluate them as working dogs and they often don't place them in working homes. It can many of them don't place them in working homes. So this may not be the best place to look. Positive signs in a rescue. Uh, the very best obviously is a working dog from a farm. Um, if he comes with stock, 
frequently the dog comes along too. Um, but if they're already working and they're on a farm, that's going to be your, your best place. Other good places are a dog that was rehabbed or evaluated by an experienced livestock guard dog person or breed club. If they originally came from a good breeder and the parents were selected for good behaviors and temperament. I've seen adult dogs that were several years old that made the complete change from a companion dog to a 24-7 LGD because they had that proper temperament. And also just pet dogs that don't have any serious behavioral issues. They make an easier transition if they're already used to living outdoors and they have that low activity level and you see good reactions to stock. Things to avoid. Unless you're experienced with livestock guard dogs, not just other kinds of dogs, you probably want to avoid these situations. So a completely unknown background is the situation that we see frequently in a shelter. All right. This dog is a big gamble and you may choose to take it, but you need to be fully aware that this may not work out. And I would ask you to have a plan for what you're going to do if it doesn't work out, because it's it's really sad to see the dog just turned around back into a shelter again. You have no idea of its background or any potential problems it has. More serious and problematical things, problematical things that you should avoid are dogs with serious stock failures already. Um, sometimes a dog does better with different stock. If it was having trouble with sheep or goats, it might be all right with cattle. But this is something a more experienced person might be able to judge. I would stay away from completely unsocialized or feral dogs. If you can't handle them and they're showing great fear of humans, this is going to make everything so much harder. Serious behavioral issues, especially aggression towards people or stock, are, are a red flag. And where you see already serious unhealthy or health issues or lameness. And so again, I'm going to ask you to harden your heart a little bit. You're not trying to rescue a dog. You're trying to find a working dog for your farm. So bringing home a puppy. So the role the dog is going to have determines everything else. If it's going to be a full-time guardian who lives with his stock, or it's going to be your house dog that sometimes goes outside and around to the barn. Full-time livestock guard dog puppies need to be out next to their future stock from the very beginning. Not in the house or the yard or the porch. Yes, they're going to cry just like a pet puppy cries in a crate the first few nights in your house. Um, if you already brought him in, get him out. You, or you're going to end up with a dog that would rather be with you or on your porch or in your house. Have this place ready before you bring the puppy home. Even if the puppy's eight weeks old, if it's healthy and it's in a suitable house, he's going to be fine outside even in winter unless it is drastically and unusually frigid. So a dog house in a pen next to or inside a stock enclosure or a stall or a pen in a barn next to animals, that's all great. He's going to need plenty of basic handling and training. Just do it where he lives and works. Include your whole family. Lots of walks in the pasture and fields, but not your yard and not off the farm. I don't recommend playing with pet dogs. You don't want to encourage rough play and chasing. He also needs to be socialized to the other animals and sights and sounds and activities on your farm. Regular farm workers, if they regularly work on your farm. Include visits to the vet and and trips in the car if you aren't going to have access to farm calls and you're going to need to take the pup in to the vet. Don't rush introductions to the other dogs you might have on your farm. Give everybody lots of time to settle and get used to, through, through, to each other through fences. Think about days, not hours here. Um, and then finally, fencing. Pups really need to learn to respect fencing right from the beginning so they don't establish bad habits. It's harder to break a bad habit than to prevent it from forming in the first place. And if the fence isn't working by itself, electric scare wires on the bottom or the top if they're trying to climb um, are an excellent thing to begin even with a pup that's two or three months old. Um, a lot of people find that invisible or radio fence systems are good backups to an existing fencing. I have used them on pups as young as four months. They learn really fast to stay away from the fence. Um, there is no need for perimeter walks. These dogs do not learn boundaries. They have no instinct to learn boundaries, and it's just kind of a waste of time for everyone. So we talk a lot about bonding, and it's common to receive conflicting advice on how to raise a full-time livestock guard dog. Um, bonding is the process of forming the connection between the pup and stock, and it ideally started before you brought the pup home. Um, 
A good friend of mine, um, livestock guard dog user and breeder Louise Labenberg, describes this as the process of combining the elements of imprinting through smell and socializing the pup to form a bond with it in livestock. Um, through the bonding process, the young pup feels, starts to feel this attachment to stock. He doesn't think he's a sheep, but he thinks this, that sheep are his companions. So how to raise a pup in different situations. Now you need to be honest and sort of self, do some self-examination here yourself. If you're an experienced livestock guard dog user with stock accustomed to living with a livestock guard dog, you're in one situation. You might have an older reliable livestock guard dog to help you and serve as a mentor. Or this pup might be the first livestock guard dog for you and your stock. You might work full time on your ranch or farm and you're around to monitor a growing pup with stock or your job might take you away from home for many hours every day. You might live on a farm where you have large flocks and you have the ability to organize different or flexible groups of stock and a pup, or your space and animals may be very limited and your choices of companions for this pup may be very limited. Your pup may have been born on a farm with excellent working parents and spent its first few weeks in close contact with stock, or maybe your pup came from an unknown background or didn't have these early experiences. And you can just fall somewhere on this continuum and combination. So in a well-established flock guarded by livestock guard dogs already, pups grow up intimately with their stock. And as they become larger, they're often penned with a few older or reliable animals that don't tolerate misbehavior but won't injure them. Um, when he's large enough, 30 to 40 pounds, the pup may even join the larger flock out with adult livestock guard dogs and human supervision. And adult and humans will continue to monitor his behavior and give him attention and work on manners. If you have an older, reliable livestock guard dog, he can be a good companion for your new pup. He might also serve as a mentor, but not all older dogs are really good teachers. Some may ignore misbehavior with the stock. Usually an older livestock guard dog is quite tolerant and accepting of a new pup. Some immediately accept it. Their nurturing instinct is sort of um, triggered and they see the pup as a little thing to take care of. Um, and sometimes it takes a few days. Now, if you don't have an older mentor, you are definitely going to need to do more supervision. If available, your pup can be kept with a couple of calm, steady animals that won't bully or injure him while you observe his behavior over time. And you may only confine him when you are away from the farm or for needed timeouts. But your situation may also be that you're not going to be there to watch the pup all the time. So you can pen the pup right next to the stock to encourage familiarity. When you constantly see good behavior when you take him out with stock for supervised visits, you can start leaving him alone where you can monitor him from a distance. When you are unable to observe him with the stock, you, you either need to tether him within the enclosure so the stock can es escape any bad behavior, or you need to put him back in his pen right next to the stock. And finally, you can't hire a trainer to do this for you. This has to be done on site with stock or poultry. You can get a pup that had a really great start, but it's still going to be your job to raise him. The first is always the most challenging, and then your experience and an older dog as a mentor will probably help you in the future. Just keep telling yourself that. <laughs> Bringing home an adult. So if you get dogs that come with their stock, like you buy a flock of sheep and the dog comes with them, those dogs should always just stay with their animals from the very beginning. But for all other adults, make sure you have a safe and secure place for your dog before you bring him home. He's going to be very motivated to escape at first and even more so if he has been a house dog. So you need a very secure pen next to your stock or near it. Don't bring him into the house. You may even need a top on this pen to keep you from climbing out. And be patient. <clears throat> this dog is stressed. Allow him time to adjust and don't rush situations. Give him days or weeks to adjust and don't overwhelm him. Be very slow when introducing him to your stock and other livestock guard dogs or other dogs if you have them. Give him attention inside the pasture or barn or wherever he's going to live, but don't also don't overwhelm him. Sometimes it's best to limit your time a little bit in the beginning because you want calmness. You don't want all this overexcitement. Treat this dog as if he was a puppy in terms of his training and socialization. As, 
in, especially if he's an adult without stock experience. Don't expect too much of your new dog too quickly. And most importantly, no matter how well things seem to be going, don't trust him completely until he has lived through about an entire year on your property. Be really cautious around birthing times or other major changes in routine, especially when it's the first time that he's seen it. Oop, we went a little bit too far here. So we're going to end our discussion today with this meme because it's uh, famous to all livestock guard dog owners. On our next webinar, we're going to look at a wide range of issues that occur with these dogs, primarily with adolescents through about age two or three, but also sometimes with adults. We're going to spend some time learning how to identify good and bad physical behavior signs because that helps inform you and what you need to do. We're going to talk about poultry guardian, which is a huge challenge all in itself. We're going to talk about multiple livestock guard dogs, how you figure out how many you need, how you introduce them. We're going to talk about aggression issues, food with other dogs, with herding your pet dogs, with stock humans. We're going to talk about failure to guard and the reasons why your dog may not be living up to what you expect out of them. And then we'll talk about the common problems, barking and roaming and dealing a bit with neighbors. So, um, we did have a lot of specific questions about breeds before the webinar. And so I'm going to refer you again to my book, Farm Dogs, because this book really goes into depth with these, um, with the discussions of the different breeds. Everything we talked about here today is also on my website and, and included in articles and blog posts or in further resources that I've linked to my um, website. I have a number of people that I find to give good and reliable advice and my contact information is on it. So I want you to check that out. The other thing that I, I want to recommend to you today is um, my favorite Facebook group, um, Learning About LGDs. It's a good place to ask a specific or urgent question right now, and you'll get input from experienced folks. Before we begin with some of the questions that you've been posting, I've been looking through questions that came in with people's registrations over these last two sessions, and I have uh, three or four questions I'm going to answer because several people asked them. Um, People asked about the size of space a livestock guard dog needs, and they can be happy in areas as small as a half acre or so, as long as they have something to do and animals to protect, as opposed to being in the same size if it was a small, confined suburban backyard with nothing to do and nothing to protect. So the size isn't always... Um, that critical because frequently these dogs are used in rotational grazing situations where people are moving stock or poultry around in electro netting and in, in the, those areas are not huge. And so that's not the problem. The problem is them not being bored and having something to do. Um, several people asked, can livestock guard dogs be taught to run off deer or neighbor dogs? And they absolutely can. You need to show them that's what you want. Um, and you need to kind of make a fool out of yourself a few times. Maybe you need to be loud and overly dramatic and chase them away and stuff. They are used successfully to keep deer away from vineyards and orchards and things like that. So yes, that can work. Um, we had people ask if a livestock guard dog can live alone on a farm at night especially if your house isn't right there, but maybe a few miles away. Yes, that's absolutely true. They can because they work in remote pastures and grazing land in lots of different situations. You should check on them every day. Obviously, you need to make sure that they're healthy and they're eating and things are fine. There are a couple of really good tools that can help you with this. There are some GPS tracking units you can put on their collars, and it allows you to see their movements on a computer back in your house, and you can sort of keep an eye on things. Trail cameras or security cameras are also really, really useful in, in lots of farm situations to see what's going on. Several people asked how you handle lambing or kidding or calving situations. And I want to advise great caution with puppies or rehomed adults in their first birthing season. Until you have confidence in a mature adult, don't leave the stock alone in, during this season without any supervision. The first time they, they, they see um, calving or lambing, have them watch through a fence, introduce them to the babies on a lead line, let them start to take in the sights and sounds of the birthing process and stuff while they're under control or not capable of interfering. Don't make a big deal out of it. Praise their calmness and 
and respect for the mom and the baby and don't allow them to interfere in the forming of the mom and baby bond and, and correct any over intrusive behavior. Um, people have mixed thoughts about whether you should allow dogs to eat after birth. Some people think it leads to them bothering ewes who are still expelling after birth or maybe chewing on a placenta or a newborn baby during a birth. This may be something you have opinions about, but I would just caution you to watch out for those potential problems. The other thing to watch out for is for dogs who steal babies from their mothers or protect the baby from the mother because it's, it's sort of awoken their um, nurturing instinct. And now I'm going to, with Larissa's help maybe here a little bit, start going and looking at um, some of the questions that you're talking about. What type of play is okay? Um, personally, all I ever did with my dog, what dogs, my dogs when they were young, was wrap around pastures with them. They don't need a lot of play. And in fact, you need to let them just sort of be entertained by their environment. I know that sounds kind of strange, but... Um, they, they're they're outside. They should be outside and available 24 hours a day. They're watching the world and animals and everything else. They don't need a lot of stimulation like a dog that's maybe in a house for hours while you are gone. Uh, someone's talking about they need help with a nine-month-old going through adolescence. And that's when the, all these problems start. Frequently, puppies are really good till about eight or nine months. Then we enter adolescence and we start to have trouble. Um, and your question, the person's question is, they put it to about six months. And yes, you're in this terrible time, like you're called terrible times with a toddler, right? Can't, can't leave them unsupervised if there's any chasing, pulling wool, um, or anything. And you're going to have to express your displeasure, put them in time out, and, and you're going to have to tether them, them unless you're supervising, you're supervising them directly. Right? I am, we, we are going to spend a lot, a lot of time talking, time talking about these, these problems, problems uh, um, in the next in the next session. session. Start to start, start address, address these specific, very very specific questions. <laughs> So Jan, we're we're getting that same audio issue that you had at the very end of the last session, um, which I don't know that we know how to clear that up. But just so you know, it's kind of like a reverberation effect going on. I did go away. It did go away last time. So hopefully we'll just cruise through. <laughs> Do you want me to read the questions then? And then. Um, Right now, right now, I saw one earlier. Uh, here's a question that says, are goats are usually split into two herds, um, in two separate two acre pastures? Would we be able to change um, which herd the dog is with? I would encourage you to do that from the very beginning. You want your dog to be flexible to what you want. And starting from the very beginning and keeping up that kind of moving them around as like sort of a no-nonsense problem is to your benefit. If they get overly bonded to just one flock and they aren't flexible for you, that's not really a good thing. So I encourage that flexibility. Is the sound getting better, Larissa? It's slightly better. Yeah. It's farther away from yeah. Computer. I wonder if that's it. That's better. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's a couple questions. How to deal with the recovery time for a dog who has been spayed? Um, don't want the dog to get too accustomed to being near the home, but need to monitor and keep her to a low activity level. Don't bring her in the house. Um, many people will maybe put them in a stall or, or something for a day or two. And then maybe you want, you need to construct a temporary pen out of livestock panels or something near their animals um, that they're because they'll frankly be more upset that they're being kept apart after a day or two. And um, people don't usually have that kind of problem um, with like a spay or a neuter. Those long recovery times tend to be if they've had some more serious operation or an injury or something. So for that, I think it's going to go better than you think. Um, how would you recommend caring for an eight month old pup through the winter when they're not stocked to guard? I would keep the dog outside, um, in the area. And you're talking about poultry in this case. And so you don't have any poultry through the winter. It is, your puppy, it says she was only eight months old. You're still so into this poultry training process that next year is still another whole year to work on it with them. And I wouldn't worry about it at all, but I would not bring them in the house. I would, I would still keep them out in their area. 
just even being outside in the country where there's animals and sights and sounds, even wild animals, is so much better than being inside. How are you doing? Larissa, do you have any other questions that you've seen? Um, let me see here. Um... Is free feeding okay? Yes. Uh, it can be fine. I know a lot of people in pasture situations use a free feeder. You may, that where we see problems um, is if the stock bothers the dog's food. And sometimes the dog needs a safe place that you can put their food, like in a pen that only the dog can get into. The, um, next session, I'm actually going to show some pictures of something we call jump gates, but you can Google them and find them. And it's a way to make a pen, maybe at a livestock panels or something, put the free feeding, you know, unit in there and the dog can jump in and out and we'll keep the stock from bothering it. Um, if it's okay if it works out for your dog, I guess that's the way to put it. I, usually, livestock guardian dogs don't overeat working livestock guarding dogs. There's a question about fence climbing with um, a puppy, a um, Marama puppy. It's not a huge problem now um, that they moved. Is it possible to fence train him with an electric top line at this point? Any age, because she's, you know, you can retrain a dog with electric scare wires at any age. You can also use invisible fencing to reinforce that physical fence if the dog keeps challenging it. I would never recommend invisible fence by itself to keep a livestock guardian dog in. But you can string the wire that you would use for an invisible fence, just string it or zip tie it to an existing fence, turn the unit all up <laughs> to the highest range, put the collar on the dog. And these dogs are smart. Within a couple of times, they realize if they get into that boundary area near the fence, they hear that warning beep and there might be a shock. And within a time or two, many of them never, ever go back there again whenever they hear that beep. Um, they don't even need to wear that collar tightly after that. But you can also train to electric fence at any age. Um, and it's, it's, it's just something that needs to be done to keep them safe. Can you go over an older livestock guard dog mentoring a pup again? We have several older dogs and are about to introduce a puppy. As I said before, um, most older dogs are really good with puppies because it they see it as a little thing that's like a baby animal and they're nurturing towards it. So that acceptance can sometimes be right away or within a few days. It It's very unusual for a, for a good working livestock guard dog to have trouble with a puppy. Um, you are going to need to watch and see if your older dogs are correcting bad behavior. And, 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 and I'm, let me think if I can see. Okay, here's an example. I brought, I rescued in a, or rehomed an 11 month old male dog once and brought it home. And I had a female who was three, who was a really good dog, put the 11 month old out with the female and Within the first couple of days, I saw these great mentoring things. The, the young male pup took a run at some livestock just out of exuberance of play, and the female just barreled into him and knocked him away as if to say, we don't do that here, and just walked away. And it only took a couple of incidences like that for the pup to realize that we don't do that here. And that's the kind of thing that you want to see, but you always need to also look and see if the older dog is simply ignoring the puppy's behavior with the stock. Um, that can also happen. So not all dogs are good mentors. Most dogs will not allow a pup to misuse their stock if they're already a good working dog. And I hope that makes sense. English Shepherd Farm Collie for a Livestock Guard Dog. No, sorry. <laughs> and I own an English Shepherd. They're a herding dog breed. They are much too small to be... Um, she, my English Shepherd weighs 44 pounds. She, she could be the size of a coyote. This isn't a fair match at all. English Shepherds are herding dogs and they are very attached to their people and they want to do, they're like little shadows and they want to do everything to please you. And they don't belong living outside 24 hours a day away from you either. And they're not large enough. Um, the real livestock guardian dog breeds have that specific set of characteristics we talked about that makes them suitable for this job and uniquely suitable for it. 
Our nine-month-old Pyrenees always barks at our cows. They're the only livestock and she does this with. How can we change this behavior? Um, barking at animals is a bad sign that's, you know, they shouldn't be doing that, trying to get that attention from them. We're going to talk more about these kinds of things. You need to stop it and you tell them no right in the act. And sometimes you have to put them in timeout. And it's just, it's the same adolescent time thing that you have to keep repeating and repeating sometimes for them to learn this lesson. How do you know if a dog is overeating? Uh, you would know if a dog is overeating if he no longer has that that lean, healthy look of a dog that's in good shape. And I think if you even just Google looking for some dog silhouette pictures and they tell you about overweight dogs or not, um, they start looking heavy on the underline and you don't see the tuck in that you should see. And you start seeing rolls of fat in places that, um, it doesn't it doesn't belong sorry i'm looking at questions at the same time if it's is it all concerning if an eight-month-old puppy rarely barks no <laughs> many puppies are um not confident of of what's going on yet you know there can be almost a little fearful and they're not barking at night eight months old is still a baby frequently we don't seem to see this sort of turn to serious protectiveness to even 18 months or two years so it's it's not a bad sign at all it's nothing to be to worry about at all if they're not with other older dogs that are doing this sometimes they do act quiet and reserved and uncertain and that confidence will just come with maturity. Jen, I have two other questions that came in in a okay. separate section. So I'll read those and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up if that's okay, okay with you. Um, right. The first one is, is it too late to correct behavior with a two-year-old that has sh shown aggress aggression towards or with stock? Um, we're, we're going to talk about this again in two weeks at the next yeah. webinar, but you need to take them back all the way to the beginning. They need to be treated like they are a young dog all over again. And even if it means a period of um, being kept in a pen or on a tether next to them and only having supervised periods, and it's worth a try because two is still this age where we see things change. Some dogs, it's more two and a half before we'll see it, but you really have to stop it. You really can't allow it to happen. And you got to just step them back um, like they're a puppy all over again. Excellent. And the last one I have from, um, and there, there might be some other ones that have come in and we'll definitely follow up with you. Anyone who's qu still has questions offline, but is how do you choose which stock to introduce first when you have multiple types? Of stock. I, yes. I, that's probably what they matter. Yes. Two, never babies. Babies don't belong with babies. In my opinion, is this too much too much probability for disaster a couple of or a group of mature animals that won't tolerate nonsense but also won't bully or hurt the dog and um that's got to sort of be your understanding of the situation and some people don't have that and that's why they have to introduce the stock and adopt puppies to stock in a more supervised way but if you do have them it works out well Sheep or goats or cattle that are used to a livestock guardian dog would always be your first choice because if your stock has never had a livestock guard dog living with them, they're going to be fearful of the dog as well. So if it's a, a more experienced adult that's used to them, that's also useful. All right. Excellent. So thank you so much, Jan. Um, that's wonderful. We will have more time next or in two weeks from now to get into some of the, the details. But I have a few housekeeping items um, just to go through before we sign off. Immediately following the webinar, you're gonna, uh, all the audience members will be asked to complete a very brief survey. And we would really appreciate if you take a minute to tell us about your experience today. Also, like I mentioned earlier, a recording of the webinar and the slides will be available soon. Um, it's going to They're going to be archived on our website, and I'm also going to email them all out to you tomorrow, along with links to Jan's website the, and the um, Livestock Guardian Dog Facebook group that were mentioned during the webinar. 
uh, we do have quite a few other webinars coming up. The one that Jan talked uh, mentioned on November 15th, uh, going into depth with the livestock guardian dog behavior. And we also have one next week about tax, tax tips for farmers. If you have questions about how the, the new tax law will impact your farm taxes, including uh, what it means for depreciation, capital pur purchases, and other deductions, I hope that you'll join us. And finally, I'd like to just give a little plug that we are currently accepting applications for our Fund of Farmer grants. You can learn more about these this grant opportunity online at foodanimalconcernstrust.org forward slash grants. Um, I'll also send out that link tomorrow. Um, the application deadline is November 28th for those of you who are interested. Um, and on that note, I, that's all the time we have for this evening. A sincere thank you to you, Jan, for your wonderful, fantastic presentation and for taking uh, time to answer all of the questions that came in. And thank you to all of our audience members for your attention and your interest and in taking time out of your day to be with us. I hope that you all have a very wonderful evening and that we're able to connect again soon. Goodbye.